for today. Let's stay up in the service. Let our mothers just enjoy resting and, and, and hearing from the Lord. So uh, you just choose to be quiet and, you know, sweet like you always are. <laughs> and the mothers start to laugh. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for being here. We have been in the book of 1 John looking at God's love for the last several months. So now we're in 1 John chapter 5. So if you'd open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 John, starting in verse 1 of chapter 5. But before we read that, I'd like to just highlight where we wrapped up last week, looking at chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. We'll start in verse 20, reading, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother he has seen cannot love the God he has not seen. And we have this command from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. This is how we know that we love God's children when we love God and obey his commands. For this is the love, I'm sorry, for this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. Now his commands are not a burden, because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. And the one who conquers the world, I'm sorry, and who is the one who conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So as we looked at last week, at verse 20 and 21 of chapter 4, we, just, we looked and broke down what it meant to love our brothers. We're not going to go back to that this morning, but just simply highlight how that leads into chapter 5 and the context that God is going after here. We have the book of 1 John, which is about God's love and our response to his great love. So... God highlights here in, in chapter 4 that it's impossible to say, I love God, but hate your brother. And since so many Christians know this to be true, we use words other than hate. Because, well, after all, we want to really say we love God. So when it comes down to it, we don't, we don't say we hate our brother. We would never go that far. That would be unloving and would mean we couldn't love God, right? So we use other terms. I can't stand my brother. <laughs> I don't like my brother. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to get on a soapbox here for a second. All right, you ready for this? On the soapbox. I'll be off it in a moment. We have this phrase in our society that says, well, I don't like him but I choose to love him. The only reason that that makes sense is because you want to believe it makes sense. Yes, love works through the difficulties, but to say I don't like somebody means you don't want to be around them. How could you possibly work at loving them if your goal is to stay away from them? Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. That was it. That was the soapbox. But we use these other terms to define how we don't like somebody because we really want to say that we love God, right? Well, well we, we really want to say we love God. So God just highlights the simplicity for us that we have to love our brothers if we know what God's love really is. If we can honestly say we love God, we have no choice but to love our brothers because it's it's impossible to accept God's love. You know what illustration that Christ gives of this? He uses the illustration of a man who had a great debt. And he went to the man that he owed the debt to, and he couldn't pay it. And the man who had this money that was loaned to this other man forgave him the debt. All right, the debt was in the, in the tens of millions of dollars if you multiply it to today's currency. And he had nothing to pay, nothing to pay. And it was just forgiven, completely forgiven. 
So he goes out and he finds a fellow servant who owes him some money. And by the way, if you figure out what the servant owed him, in today's currency, it was about ten, ten to $15,000. Not an insignificant amount when you don't have money, right? <laughs> but with this man who was forgiven millions, who obviously needed the money, but he goes out to his fellow brother who owes him about ten to $15,000, and says, I'm going to put you in jail until you can pay. And so his, his other brothers and servants who are watching this scene unfold, they go back to the guy that just forgave him and says, you're not going to believe what just happened. We, we couldn't believe it when we saw it. And the point of the story that Christ shares is that if you, for, if you have been forgiven a lot, you know how to forgive a lot. But if you don't know what it means to be forgiven, you will not be able to forgive. And then he jumps in, the Lord goes on into what we have as chapter 5 here in the book of 1 John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. So you can, in, order, in order to truly love God, you, you must believe in the Messiah. And this is where the encouragement comes for us as believers. We do believe in the Messiah. We do want to love God. After all, that's why most of you are here today. You're in a church because you believe in the Messiah and you want to love God. So it says, everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. This is how we know that we love God's children. Isn't this great? He just said you have to love your brothers. You have no choice. But this is how we know that we love God's children. Don't you love when God breaks it down and makes it so simple? Because if, we, we, if, we left, if God had left off and not given us this how you know part, We'd be left off to go together and, and try and figure out, well, what, is, what does it mean to love this person? And we'd come up with all sorts of explanations and examples and, and, and problem solving. And we could focus group this and we could, we could work it through a team. And we could say, okay, we're going to figure out how we can love. But in the end, it's just what we come up with on how to love. Yet God gives it to us right here. He says, this is how we know that we love God's children. When we love God... And obey his commands. For this is what love for God is. You ready for this bombshell? Love for God is to keep his commands. Now sometimes when you read scripture, you see God preemptively striking down your next thought. Because he says to love God is to keep his commands. And what does God follow? But immediately he follows up with, now his commands are not a burden. But what is our immediate thought when it's, well, if I love God, I keep his commands. <gasps> oh, my goodness. <laughs> if only. <laughs> All right, Lord, I really want to think I love you, but you don't know what you're talking to. I mean, you do know, but I mean, you don't know. <laughs> And yet God preemptively says his commands are not a burden. So what are these commands that are not a burden? Now, I'm so glad you asked. Look with me would, at, at Matthew chapter 22. Start with me in verse 34, Matthew twenty-two thirty-four. 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Now, we know how this story ends, and most of us could recite these next couple verses. So let me just back up real quick and say that this guy who was an expert in the law would have been able to recite 
from memory every single law that God had given to the people of Israel. He would have been able to tell you the, the priorities in the law. He would have been able to tell you the things that were less priorities. He, he was the guy that the, that the spiritual leaders went to to learn about the importance of the law and what it meant to them. This guy was an expert. He knew the law better than anybody around him. And so he asked Christ a question based on his exhaustive study of the law. His question was, Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? Which one is the greatest? You had to believe everybody around him couldn't believe he was asking that question because don't you believe that question had been debated by these people for generations? Had been gone back and forth on different sides of the debate. Nobody knowing for sure. And so this guy poses the one question that he knows there's no good answer to. We know what Christ said, so we feel so good about ourselves. Like, oh, I know, I know it's to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. <laughs> yeah, I get it, I get it. This was earth-shattering news to these people. People who knew the law and studied the law, this was world-rocking to them. This was something they had never been able to nail down in their entire lives. Years of study, years of debate, years and years, generations of understanding and contemplation. Which is the great commandment in the law? The greatest one, the most important, and Christ just simply quotes Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. That's it. We know this to be true. But what we don't think about when it comes to loving God is how earth-shattering this news is. Because everywhere you go, every Christian that you talk to, every spiritual leader that you listen to, every single one of them has an opinion on how you should love God best. Every single one of them will express what they think God wants you to do. Everybody will tell you, this is how you love God. This is how you be a Christian. This is what Christ expects of you. And then some even go so far as to say, this is what you must do to be an upstanding member in our church. We're so convinced of this, you will not be allowed to be an upstanding member unless you do what we say here. Because this is so important to God. And we are surrounded on all sides by people trying to tell us this is what we should live. This is what we should do. This is what God expects. And our mind gets so filled, so cluttered, so invaded with this information that the simplicity of loving God becomes this complex labyrinth that we try to navigate on a weekly and daily and sometimes hourly basis that we honestly don't know if God's pleased with us when we're done. I know I've felt that way before. Have, maybe some of you have felt this way. And here God, in his incredible wisdom, in his understanding of what he was after from the beginning of time, drops this earth-shattering bombshell into the unbelievable labyrinth of Old Testament laws. God is after loving him with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this, this second part, do you know Christ did not have to add that? Do you know, 
1 John says in chapter 1 that, Christ, that there's a new command that came from Christ. This is the new command. This, this actually is an addition to what God said in Deuteronomy. Christ quotes Deuteronomy in, in verse 37, but in verse 38, Christ adds this component that he didn't have to add because what was he asked? Was he asked for the second commandment in the law? No, he was asked for the greatest commandment. So he was asked for the greatest commandment. He dropped this bombshell on the greatest commandment. But then, because he is God, because he had more in store for you and I, because he wants us to understand that this love of God goes way beyond ourselves, that it's so much bigger than we are, that he says there's a second command that is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how many of you have heard somebody say, don't raise your hands, because I think most of us would probably raise our hands, that you love your neighbor as you treat your neighbor as you would treat yourself. Right? We've heard this before. So if I, would do, if I wanted this for me, I would do the same thing for them. But that's not exactly what God says. God says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Not treat them as you treat yourself. You realize we don't treat ourselves as much as we love ourselves. <laughs> we love ourselves so much that the first th waking thought in the morning is how do I feel? The final waking thought before I go to sleep is how tired I am. And every single thought in between revolves around every, how everything affects me. I'm hungry. I want to go eat. I want to feel fulfilled. So I go and I do some work. I need some money so I can take care of myself. So I go and I do some work. I want some friends who care about me. So I find people that I agree with on some things and I care about them. But what I really want is I want them to respond in kind. And, and this whole life that I think and feel and do, I'm at the center of it. And I'm really speaking about me here, okay? I'm not speaking this proverbially, proverbially about you. I'm saying this is how I think. I'm going to guess some of you think the same way. And so God says to love your neighbor as yourself. Think about them and what's best for them as much as you think about what is best for you. Not just how you treat yourself. What is best? What you really wish for yourself. How you would love yourself if you could. Now love them that way. But he says his com commands are not a burden. And we have commands in scripture, don't we? Right? Christ said he didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill it. So aren't there commands in Scripture that God is after? Look with me at Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. Verse chapter 5. We're just going to hit a couple highlights here, okay? Verse 21 of chapter 5. You have heard that it was said... To our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. Verse 31, if you, you, it, was, it was also said... Whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, who divorces, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oath to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. 
Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies. Let's go down to chapter 6. Verse 19, don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but collect for yourselves treasures in, in heaven. Verse 25, this is why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Verse, chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge so that you won't be judged. Verse 24 of chapter 7, Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who has built his house on the rock. All right, now, come back with me here. What I was highlighting in the Sermon on the Mount is Christ was taking these commands and he was, he was transforming their intention because everybody looked at the commands as if that was the way to heaven. That was the way to please God. And Christ went after the heart and he said, no, God's after how you love your brother. He's not after the action that you do against them. He's after the intent of your heart towards those around you. Now, he, remember he said in, in 1 John chapter 5, his commands are not a burden. He says in verse 4, because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. Let me share an illustration with you here. Most of you are familiar with the difficulty of becoming a U.S. Marine. They claim to have the most difficult training process. I know that if you're from a different branch of the military, there's a lot of argument. I'm not trying to create an argument. We're just going to go based off their claim, okay? All right? I'm not saying it's reality, but just bear with me as I use this illustration. U.S. Marines go through a challenging boot camp. We will all have to admit it's challenging. It is, it is claimed to be the most challenging army entry training of any army in the world. And that's the claim. So the guys that go through uh, Marine boot camp, when they finish, they are more thoroughly prepared for battle than any other soldiers around the world, supposedly, right? So they go through the boot camp. They go through the training. And by the way, it's not fun. It's not designed to be fun. It's not designed for them to write home and say, boy, I just want to make a vacation here. This is fantastic. I can't wait. It's not designed for them to write home and say, hey, send all my siblings. They're going to love this. But when they finish boot camp and they finish their job training and they go out into the military workforce prepared as best as anyone in the world is for battle. At that point, how do they view the difficult training that they went through? They're prepared more than anybody else in the world is for battle. Do you think that they look back on the difficulty of that training and wish they hadn't had to go through it? Do you think they look back and think, wow, that was just unbearable? I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. No, as a matter of fact, they're so thankful for it. They insist that if anybody is going to join them and be a comrade by, that, by their side going into battle, that they better go through the same boot camp and be as thoroughly prepared as I am because I only want somebody who knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing fighting with me. So when you talk to a U.S. Marine about their boot camp, do you think that they would say their boot camp was a burden to their success? No, it was key to their success. Not a burden, it was key to their success. 
So let's look at this from God's perspective. God gives us some really simple, basic commands. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. These encompass the entirety of the law and the prophets. Why are they not a burden? Because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. Let me read that again. Whatever has been born of God conquers the world. Do you realize that your faith in Christ, your faith in doing what God said is important, loving God and loving your brothers, conquers the world? You are given guaranteed victory over the world. Is it always easy to love God? No. Is it always easy to love your brothers? That's a more emphatic no. <laughs> but in light of what God's preparing you for, in light of what he promises that you will do, is it really a burden? No. It's the key to your success. It's the only reason you will be successful. When you, by faith, choose to love God, and then by faith choose to love your brothers who are around you, God says, whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our works. Oh, well, I'm sorry. No, that's not what it says. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our service to the Lord. No, because it's only by faith you can actually love somebody who doesn't deserve it. It's only by faith that you can deny yourself and love God with your time and with your resources and with your energy. It's only by faith that you can do that and say that it actually conquers the world. Because you know what? In the process, at that moment of training, you don't feel like you're conquering the world. You feel like you're losing to the world. You feel like it hurts. And so it's only by faith that you say, no, I'm going to push through those feelings. I'm going to push through the difficulty. I'm going to believe that God actually knows what he's talking about, that his word actually is true, and that he, this is exactly what God has called me to do. And by faith. You will conquer the world. And who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This one is really simple, folks. Is Jesus the Son of God? If the answer in your heart is yes, then you have no choice but to go forward by faith and believe what he said is most important. He said that loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind is all that matters to God. That is the first and foremost, it is the most important. Nothing else matters aside from loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And when you get that one right, there's a second that is similar. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if Jesus is the Son of God, then you and I have no choice but to say, okay, God, if there is anything in my life that is keeping me from doing what you have said is the most important thing that could possibly exist, then God, it can't stay in my life. If there's any attitude or any action or any forgiveness or any difficulty that keeps me from loving God first, then I have to repent and turn to my Savior 
and do what he said is important. If there's anything that keeps me from loving my brother in the same way as I love myself, I have to repent, turn to my Savior, and do what he said is important. I hope that most of you are working to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. There's always room for improvement. There's no doubt about that. But I hope you're working at it. But maybe you're here today and you could say, Steve, I don't know. I'd like to think I'm working at it, but I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm not sure. You know, at a moment like this in church, it sounds good, but I, yeah, I know what happened last week. Maybe I'm not working at it like I think I should. Yeah. Maybe God knows I'm not working at it. The answer is simple. By faith. Trust that God is telling you the truth. And let that truth change whatever it needs to change. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the value of your truth. Lord, thank you that your love is so great, so life-changing. Thank you, Lord, that all we need to know is your great love, and you have said that that love will change everything. Lord, it is only a rational response of worship, according to Romans 12. I pray that you would help each one of us to be able to worship you well as we respond to your great love. This morning we are going to close.